Hello, everyone. I'm Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association, and I must apologize because we've had the traditional technical snafus uh, with Zoom, uh, which all of us are getting very tediously bored with after several years of COVID, I think, <coughs> uh, zoomed out. Um, now we're going to zoom in on the UN and our guest today, our guest, in fact, is Mukesh Kapila, uh, who is renowned blogger, humanitarian, author, was the whistleblower who first tried to draw the attention of the UN to actual genocide being perpetrated in Darfur. And uh, you know, this is one of those issues where the UN and the foreign diplomats, bureaucracies all run to one because genocide involves legal duties on governments, which is why they're very eager not to use the word. As um, James Baker said in the Balkans, uh, we don't have a dog in this fight. So people have been very careful not to use the word. Uh, Mokesh, to his credit, did so. And as a result, the president of Sudan was uh, indicted before the International Criminal Tribunal, um, International Criminal Court, I should say, uh, as a result of this. <clears throat> but the particular issue today, this moves on to the fact that Mukesh has been studying and recounting and whistleblowing on the mixture of ineptitude and corruption that sometimes characterizes the UN. <clears throat> and at the core of it all is impunity. Just like the New York Police Department and the New Orleans Police Department and the other police departments, senior UN officials do not think that they have to suffer any consequences. Um, they get promoted sideways, they get given other jobs, they very rarely get fired, they very rarely have to pay. And in this particular case that uh, Mukesh blew the whistle on, the um, little known UN agency that acts as, uh, how should we say, the agent for many of the other UN agencies. The UN, uh, UN OPS is the ex executing agency. It executes the contracts for which it takes a percentage of the value of the contracts. And apparently this was a very good percentage. They built up a fund of some $70 million. And what Mukesh has revealed is this on the whim of the director of UN OPS uh, was lent to a businessman of, um, let's just say questionable provenance for projects that hadn't been tested or examined in any way. And um, everybody seems to have got away with it. Uh, the person concerned says, oh, he'll repay the loans, the, the businessman. And it, it comes down to a whole core of issues around the United Nations of impunity, of balkanization almost as the agencies do their own thing and inept policing by the UN. Um, Mukesh and I have spoken earlier, and I think we all agree that the UN's own investigating department, the OIOS, is basically the lineal equivalent of the Keystone Cops for their comic ineptitude and failure to follow things through. But that's not my, we're here to ask Mukesh these questions. Mukesh, can you explain the background of the, uh, of the scandal? Well, it's, uh, as always in these uh, matters, uh, the complexification is actually done by uh, people who have a vested interest in hiding things. And the reality at UNOPS is, was very, very simple. And you know the saying that uh, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And this could be applied totally to the senior management of UNOPS at that time led by Greta Fremel, executive director, uh, a former uh, uh, Norwegian uh, uh, minister, and who assembled a bunch of like-minded people around her, each with their own dubious uh, backgrounds. And together, they drove a coach and horses through the UN's rules on uh, management, accountability, and financial propriety. So the UN has good rules in all these areas, but Greta Faremo and her group, her deputy Vitaly Vanchel Boim and uh, others like the chief legal advisor, uh, James Provenzano and uh, finance of, of officer, uh, uh, Marianne de la Touche and others, they simply completely ignored all the rules and uh, made up their own uh, project. Now this is only possible because over previous years, the organization had systematically overcharged donors 
And by the way, United States is a uh, UNOPS is uh, uh, a biggest bilateral contributor, uh, and the UK is my own country is is next, and uh, uh, and then multi multiple organizations like the World Bank, etc., also use it as a contractor. So basically, what he did was through overcharging on its projects over many years, and also what I have called rent-seeking behavior, which means which means renting out the UN logo to be put on uh, projects and activities that it could then uh, shelter under the privileges and immunities of the UN system, but in return for which, of course, you have to pay. Uh, it's like selling passports. I mean, some countries uh, sell their passports for money. Uh, UNOPS sells the UN logo for, for money. As a result of these uh, corrupting activities, it accumulated a war chest running into hundreds of millions uh, of, of dollars far in excess of the operational reserve authorized by its, its board. So the organization, which works in 80 odd countries, has a budget of uh, uh, approaching $4 billion, has thousands of staff all over the, all over the place, does good work in many places. Uh, however, accumulated this war chest, which then its geniuses at, uh, in charge at the top decided that they would gamble with it through constructing a highly dubious uh, syndicate of progr a program, which uh, uh, it is not released as documents as to exactly what happened, but net result of it all in complete violation of every UN rule you can think of. And I speak as a person who's worked for many years in the UN uh, system, apart from coming from a donor background. Um, well, basically the money just went. So, it was actually a very, in the end, it's a very, very simple, the facts are actually quite simple, though people try to complicate it. Now, I, I, I mean, one of the things was she actually boasted about this, how she'd done away with all these rules and regulations. She used the, uh, you know, the current rhetoric of the Washington consensus that uh, rules and regulations are an impediment to enterprise and activity. Uh, instead of being safeguards against corruption and, and, and she, she boasted that frequently that she'd done away with all these regulations. So, I mean, she was sending clear signals if, if any under any of the governments have been watching. Well, uh, you know, uh, I think the, the UN, uh, uh, which is a noble institution that I've certainly devoted uh, virtually all my professional uh, life in, either as a donor or working within the UN system in a number of different uh, agencies, and that has included being associated with uh, UNOPS. Um, uh, you know, uh, and the UNOPS's own mission statement talks about making the world a better place, helping the poor and vulnerable. It's all about uh, uh, increasing the capability to do good amongst uh, the most, uh, uh, for the most deserving communities and, and, and nations in the front lines of uh, conflict and um, uh, situation like Afghanistan, where I've seen its work in Sudan, where I even hired UNOPS when I was the head of the UN in Sudan, I hired UNOPS execute some of the projects for which I was uh, responsible. So, you know, th that's the background. So when Greta Fremer comes along, and by the way, she alone could not do this. She, as I said, her whole senior leadership team did it. Many of those, uh, uh, those geniuses are still in, in position at the, at the moment. So what they did was they, they basically uh, threw all those things aside. So they turned UNOPS, Greta and her cronies turned UNOPS into a profit-making organization. That wasn't the intention of the founders of the UN, which is basically all the member states uh, that represent us in the General Assembly and in the executive board, which consists of uh, scores of states. Uh, you know, the UNOPS board, uh, UNOPS, UNDP, UNFP board is meeting right now as you speak in, in New York. So, uh, so these people turned it into a profit making venture, making money out of the most vulnerable and poorest people on the planet. In my book, that is the most unforgivable and reprehensible act. And the marvel is that the board of this organization, including incidentally at a time when I was uh, in the UK government, uh, I also occasionally went to the UNOX board's meeting. So in a sense, we were all culpable. We somehow tolerated all this. This is daylight robbery that has taken place under the gaze of the world's nations so it's not done in secret. It's not done under the table. It's been done by running a horse and coaches through the whole system. 
Therefore, the embarrassment and accountability, which obviously is rightly due to the UNOPS uh, leadership, many of whom I'm afraid are still in power, but is, all, is also has to be shared by the highest levels of the United Nations system itself, including previous and current secretary uh, generals, uh, uh, in addition to the member states. If we I should, can pick uh, up there, could I ask a question? Oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. The United States, in the last 24 hours has put out a statement that's been supported by 25 other member states at this executive committee meeting. They are now calling for uh, a full accounting of the program, also suspending it, transferring funds into the UN Ops Operational Reserve. Uh, do you think that will be done? And why were they not on top of this to begin with? Why they were not on top of it uh, at the beginning? Let me answer that first you, by, by simply yes. saying that uh, Greta Faremo and the senior leadership uh, uh, team, which are still in power, uh, even though she has been fired or forced to resign, uh, she, uh, the, 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 and Jens Wendell has taken over uh, to try and see what he can do. But people like Honore uh, Danny, who is a overall director of operational programs, people like Marion De La Touche, chief financial officer, uh, James Romanzano, the chief legal uh, counsel who actually designed and pressed the buttons on all this, Peter Brown communications and, and, and uh, Nico Regan, who is the director of standards. They're still in, in position, okay? So, uh, so to, answer your, uh, to, um, to answer your question, they lied, blatantly lied. They lied and I can't, I can't think of a, as clear terminology as I'm doing now. They lied, they lied. If you look in the documents that have been uh, uh, leaked or that are publicly available on the website, or you examine the correspondence that has just taken place between the government of Finland, which is the host of this S3I project the, at the heart of this uh, scandal, and uh, the, and the UNOPS uh, uh, executive di uh, director, you will see that the executive director who has just replied a few days ago to the government of Finland, who's outraged, is a bunch of lies. And that's how the governments of the world were fooled and they continue to be, to be fooled. And this problem is not going to be solved, especially when the investigation authorities themselves, whether it is the Office for Oversight Services, which is part of Antonio Guterres's uh, 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 office in, uh, in, in New York, or the internal investigation group, which is part of, uh, are part of uh, UNOPS, when they themselves, in a sense, are not independent, not uh, impartial, when they are actually conniving with the cover-up. So don't be surprised these things uh, happen. So I think the United States and others who are now uh, belatedly woken up because they're embarrassed because this has happened while they were sleeping in their job. I mean, the, the board of UNOX, for example, is a bunch of amateurs. Uh, the ambassadors in New York, who are greatest friends of mine and I respect and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. But quite honestly, you cannot run a $4 billion organization in your spare time over a couple of hours meeting every quarter or uh, something and, on the, and then rely on statements which are unvalidated, unsupported, documents which are hidden away and even as you speak now, and in the last weeks of Greta Fremo's uh, regime, uh, they, were being, uh, they were being cleaned away. Uh, uh, you know, they were being, uh, history was being rewritten. We've got plenty of evidence to show of the lies and the systematic cover up that has taken place within UNOPS and the wider UN Secretariat and continues this present day. That's how the countries were fooled. And Before we go on, we, we should give uh, due recognition to. Uh, the New York Times that did a sort of fairly detailed expose of the particulars of the UNOPS and one of the things we want to do is to go into the background not just uh, what but how and why and uh, you know to remind people who haven't seen this in this particular case uh, for Amo the director handed over 70 million dollars to, uh, to, to, to a particular British businessmen with extensive interests across the Caribbean and other places I've been chasing to build houses that were never built uh, with a very dubious financial track record. On his own admission, he used the money from UNOPS to pay off existing debts 
which the UN auditors didn't seem to have discovered, reinforcing what Mukesh is saying about the incompetence of the people concerned. And, you know, part of it is, how could this happen? How could one person manage to give away $70 million to somebody who she met at a party? And also engaged the guy's daughter, apparently, to, to sing a song about the oceans uh, uh, at a, a, an empty conference hall in the UN. I mean, it gets to this whole um, semi-privatization of the UN where NGOs and uh, ambassadors of very small countries can do things uh, and, and make introductions and take money from the main organization. And no one seems to notice because there's... Like in the sexual harassment cases, there's an omerta that a sort of thin blue line here that, in fact, it's a very thick blue line that no UN senior official will ever be held to account for their deeds, whether it's financial or sexual. Uh, and uh, I know Kristen has looked at these in the past and got the runaround from the, the UN when <laughs> questions have been asked. Do, do you want to chip in on that, Kristen? Yeah, well, I, I'm just the, the whole program the sustainable investments in infrastructure and innovation s3i program sounds like it is against the very mandate of un ops to begin with it's supposed to be dedicated to implementing projects for the un system uh, governments and other partners uh, providing support so when how it could become a development organization with no one noticing that. Are there some reforms that could help that? And I'm wondering if you have any tips, Mukesh, for journalists. Um, you know, I've been in and out of the United Nations for the last 15 years. And until this story broke, I'd never heard of UN Ops before and uh, was surprised to find out that in Copenhagen, there's a UN city with 10 different agencies and 2000 employees. There was a branch office in Helsinki. How, how, what would you recommend that the UN do for better oversight? And what would you recommend for journalists? What tipped you off? And if it weren't for you, how would this have come to light? Well, the UNOPS uh, scandalous story we are discussing now is a direct consequences of the abuse of power within the UN system. Now, the UN hides behind its status of uh, immunities and privileges. Those status of immunities and privileges, it means that it is uh, supreme unto itself. It makes its own rules which govern its own people and its operations, and it decides uh, what is right and wrong within its own framework of uh, laws, which it creates, and it judges them according to, its say, according to its own systems of investigation, and it releases or not releases information um, uh, as and when it chooses, and usually it doesn't release information. And even though it is entirely funded by the member states of the world and the UN preaches uh, rule of law and uh, transparency and accountability uh, and uh, justice and all those kinds of virtues to all its member states, it is immune uh, uh, from it, which means that member states uh, are unable to hold it accountable. Mm -hmm. And it is, you only have to remember the oil for food scandal, which ravaged the UN uh, you know, when uh, at the time of Kofi Annan, when he was a uh, secretary uh, general. And it was only when the federal authorities of the United States investigated after Kofi Annan was, was pressured to remove the immunity of UN officials uh, um, uh, that were implicated, that it was possible to learn how UN officials had connived to rob uh, both Iraq and the rest of the world of literally billions, if not tens of billions of, of dollars. This was not a UN investigation. So the, there is, a, you know, there is no kind of a rocket science in this. Uh, you know, if you set yourself up as judge, jury, executioner, and you decide what the rules of evidence are and what you will do or not do, don't be surprised these things happen. Now, you know, corruption and fraud and mismanagement and misconduct happen everywhere in all the institutions all over the world, they happen in all governments uh, uh, everywhere. Even in my own uh, uh, government in the UK, Boris Johnson recently, only yesterday, had to have a voting of uh, confidence against him, you see? 
at least, and it is not to say that these are, this happens only in the UN, on the contrary, but it is only the UN that asserts its impunity in a way that even the most worst dictatorships in the world find it difficult to do. And they're talking about keeping this report secret, right? We, there seems to be little pressure to, well, there was until this US statement just came out calling for it to be released. That is I think pressure. That the UN to... will, and the Secretary yeah. General will do that. Also, one other follow up 22 million initially when the report came out in the New York Times, the agency said $22 million was at risk of being lost. Uh, do you think? that's the limit? Do you think it's more than that? Uh, the, as far as we know, no, none of these uh, affordable housing units have been built, correct? Well, uh, as been well established, no houses have been built. And according to uh, Jens Wendel, the acting director of uh, UNOPS, uh, the figure is that theoretically, and this is from a board briefing uh, on the uh, middle of May, roughly, uh, at least uh, around uh, 58, 59, 60 million dollars could be at risk. How much of that comes back? I have no idea. So that will remain to be seen because uh, there is a process underway whereby UNOPS has asked the Office for Legal uh, Affairs in the UN Secretariat to pursue both uh, disciplinary action with human resources people as well as legal action to get the money uh, richer. We'll wait and see uh, uh, whether and how that, uh, that happens. The money seems to have run into a swamp of subsidiaries and companies and small islands scattered around. And uh, it's, uh, I, I think that what they're, they're, from looking at it, to save face, they were saying that the money wasn't actually lost until they tried to reclaim it and they couldn't get it. Even though it's fairly clear, it's, uh, it has evaporated through this well, it's, system. Uh, it's, it's an accounting technique, isn't it? I mean, unless, you know, you know with debt, uh, the debt uh, until it's brought to book. It's an asset. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's still out there, right? But mm -hmm. they've already brought to book 22 million of, uh, uh, of debt, which uh, in their best judgment, uh, this is a year or two ago, uh, they're not likely to recover. Now, the rest, I think as uh, Jens Wendel, the acting director, confessed uh, in the recent uh, brief, uh, briefing, uh, which is uh, worth listening to, uh, but the record is now no longer available, part of the lack of transparency in the UN uh, system. But luckily, many of us could watch it uh, when it was first uh, put online. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's clear that uh, many of this, is, much of this is uh, uh, possibly not going to be recovered. That's the gist of what we have heard. Uh, you know, of course, uh, the point is that, okay, millions and millions get lost uh, all over the place through inefficiency, corruption, and this is not the first case we have heard. But never before in my experience, at least of the international system where I've spent uh, God knows how many decades of, of my life, the very top of an organization are the co-conspirators in what appears to be, in the words of the executive director himself, the acting executive directors, a potential fraud. I understand that the... Um... The businessman at the core of all of this, <clears throat> and I was checking his record as well. He, he's done this in the Caribbean. He, he has taken money for building houses that he never built, uh, and he was then bankrolled by UNOPS to cover the losses there. And then the Chinese came in in very dubious circumstances as well, <clears throat> which seems to be the nexus of corruption. And, and small islands are a good way to get in here. Uh, he was in Antigua and Barbuda, and it's. Uh, it, it's. I understand that his response to this has been to threaten to sue you for libel in the British uh, libel courts. And for those of you who don't know, and I'm a practicing journalist from Britain for many, many years, uh, the British libel courts mean that evil people who've got money can sue and get away with it. I won't make any direct connections, but Johnny Depp lost in Britain and won in America uh, without any questions for the case. And the, the firm that uh, this guy has used, I would personally, as a, my experience as a journalist, would take it as almost a confession of guilt because it, they have sued on behalf of oligarchs, they've sued on behalf of bent politicians, they've sued on behalf of everybody who's got money who's been found with their hand in the till or the 
person in the wrong bed. Uh, and are you worried about this? Uh, you're not in Britain, so the, the, the reach of the bent British libel law can't get you yet? Uh, well, uh, let's wait and see. I think uh, uh, jurisdiction issues are more complicated than that. However, the point is this. Uh, you know, in the search for truth, <clears throat> we cannot be intimidated. So I'm, even if I get sued, which hasn't happened yet, but it's been threatened, then the worst that will happen is that uh, they will take uh, at, the worst that will happen is if they win, which is very unlikely because I think we, we have all the facts and the evidence. And uh, I think uh, if it ever got to court, all the files and accounts would have to be opened up of all the intermediary involved in transactions running into tens of millions of dollars. And then the facts can be, can be clarified. So I'm not intimidated uh, by this. And Good. more and more things are coming out, which actually illustrate that this complex web. However, my con main concern is not with individual businessmen. My main concern is with the framework that spawns fraud and corruption, misconduct and mismanagement. That is uh, the UN system. Uh, uh, in this case, you know, in, in particular. So it's not about one businessman or uh, uh, his daughter or anything like that. It's about the system that allows these things to happen. And you must also know that the, the publicity is now uh, in the last few weeks, but the alarm was raised internally by people and the internal diligence was done by good people working in uh, UNOPS uh, as long ago as 2017. And we are now talking about 2022. And despite the, the in, internal question marks being raised as much as five years ago, and, uh, and queries raised, but how can you do business in this particular way? There are real questions to be asked about the allocation of funds in this uh, uh, kind of monopolistic uh, uh, manner, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the management uh, data framework and the cronies, they, they still carried on, not just carried on, but they wrote check after check after check. So it's, it's not as if, my God, we were caught sleeping and now I'm very sorry. This was being done, even though alarm was raised as long ago as 2017 and the internal investigations of the UN uh, had drawn, had been, their attention had been drawn to this matter. But what the Office for Oversight uh, Services did, headed by a man called uh, Ben uh, Swanson, is that he closed down the investigations and referred the matter back to UNOPS, which of course, where the internal investigation group reported directly to Greta Faremo, meaning the police, you know, in any other organization in the modern system of good governance, you would have an internal function of uh, uh, inspecting the rights are being done, would report directly to the board or to some independent authority. But in this case, uh, Greta Faremo had set up the structure in such a way that the compliance body the investigation body, the ethical body and the audit body, they're all reported to the same person, uh, the boss, who's making all the rules. So what do you think? You know, it doesn't, again, as I say, you don't need to be an Einstein to figure out that this was bound to happen and it happened. And the uh, roots of that were des by design in the system. This is taking it to extremes uh, compared, but lots of other UN agencies that I've investigated over the years have exactly the same problem is the head is doing something wrong. The phalanx around them realize this and realize they can exploit it to their own advantage because the, he the head of the organization can't pick on them for what they're doing. So you get this whole culture of corruption oozes down the organization. And whistleblowers like yourself, if they're in the organization, in fact, we've had a note from a former uh, UN staffer who is involved and says that they cannot speak because of the uh, atmosphere of intimidation and um, retaliation. Uh, the thing is that the perpetrators have, have you ever heard of one actually being fired and not getting the pension? There've been one or two cases, but very few. Well, and none of them have been asked to make restitution of the money that's gone, gone walkies. The way the UN system accountability works is that usually uh, they persuade the wrongdoer 
to leave, uh, rather than cause embarrassment. And once the person leaves the UN, then they're not pursued. So you can literally do your misdoings, even make millions from it, and then uh, go off and uh, live somewhere uh, safe. And be employed as a UN consultant by another agency. Well, that's uh, happened. This will happen as well. Now, and what that also means then is that I don't think anything is going to come out of this UNOP said the truth unless the investigations are done by competent national authorities. That's what, why I have asked for the United States federal authorities to be involved because the headquarters of the UN is in, uh, is in uh, New York and because a major office of uh, UNOPS where the chief legal counsel of UNOPS, James Provinzano lives and works is based in New York or the Danish authorities because the headquarters of UNOPS is in Denmark or the government of Finland where the SCI office uh, uh, is based. So, uh, you know, uh, unless a national authority with the criminal investigation and judicial powers has the authority to bring the wrongdoers to justice, I don't think Antonio Guterres uh, has, the, uh, has the, either the will or the authority to do that. And, and, and that's the tragedy of all this and why, uh, you know, I get uh, somewhat uh, uh, angry and that is how the system created for the global good is, uh, is uh, actually betraying the people of the world. And these are the well-paid people at the top who connive with each other to betray the peoples of the world. No wonder there is so much uh, cynicism about uh, multilateral solutions so much cynicism about international uh, cooperation. And now, as I understand, many donors are withdrawing funding from UN agencies. And if I, you know, and I've counseled to them, I've, I've written to every country in the world and I've had responses from many countries have said that they're shocked by what's happened. They've begun their own investigations and countries like Finland, uh, the European Union uh, uh, and uh, others, they've actually stopped funding to UNOPS and some have said they're going to stop funding to the UN. Now, defunding the UN is not in our interest because we need the UN even more than ever in this era of uh, global problems requiring global uh, solutions. So it's an utter disgrace and negligent when leaders of the UN, whether it's the UN itself or whether it's organization like UNOPS, that betray uh, humanity in this particular way. That's why I get, I get so irate about this whole business. Mukesh, we have an interesting uh, uh, relevant question in the chat. Uh, what can we as journalists do to uncover these misdeeds, corruption? Uh, as this person points out, and, and we've all experienced, uh, there's only so much interest in investigations. They take a lot of time. It's hard to track down. It takes a lot of resources. Uh, any thoughts on how um, journalists can do a better job uh, getting their hands around stories like this. And what do you think of the coverage? It took uh, DevX, which is basically a, a very specific kind of media outlet that focuses on development issues to, to bring this story to a bigger audience um, that you were writing about. Are, are you satisfied with the press coverage of this so far? And, and how can the media capitalize on this to get at the heart of the matter and get at those reforms that you think are needed? Uh, well, in the course of my professional uh, life, spanning 30, 40 years, I've had nothing but respect for journalists who have risked themselves. I mean, literally physically risked themselves. Uh, some of my best friends have been imprisoned sometimes for months, if you like, in the cause for investigating wrongdoings in countries including certain people we know well in Al Jazeera itself. Now, at the same time, I'm struck by how journalists are somehow constrained by the rules of their trade. And sometimes they don't have the courage to speak up because they don't have the full story. So therefore they don't speak up uh, because they haven't got the full story. Now I know all about balance and all the, uh, and all the, all the rest of it. The reason I decided to simply write on my own blog is that I want to remain independent. I will not be beholden to anyone else. I never went to any journalist. I never spoke to anyone. 
The New York Times never even approached me. They referenced me in their article, but they never spoke to me. And uh, I, I had no interest in writing or speaking to the New York Times or any other uh, journal. I did not approach DevEx. They approached me. And, and, uh, and when people approach me, I, I share with them what I know up to the limits of uh, what I know. And then they must do their own particular uh, investigations. So the only tip I can say to journalists is investigate, uh, look into things, speak up, write about it and try to create a culture of wider transparency about this whole, uh, uh, this whole business. Because, you know, and the fact is that some stories are more or less uh, uh, newsworthy. I mean, who on earth is really interested in uh, the loss of a few uh, million dollars in a, a small organization on which most people have never even heard of, uh, you know, somewhere far away, about some obscure, uh, complicated uh, handlings. I'm not surprised that this is not a story. And yet I'm amazed that within two months of writing uh, one or two paper, uh, articles and the New York Times picking it up, it is now worldwide, uh, worldwide news. And I've had links sent to me of articles in, in something like 50 languages. If you, uh, if you like to say, I can't read those articles. You do, okay. <laughs> I, I, have to, I have to Google, Google, Google Translate to, to know what the people are, talk, are talking about. And all I can say is, please, if you, if, if you are interested in truth saying, if you're interested in, in writing about what is happening in our, in our world, whoever you are, whatever journalist you are, whatever organ you work for or not, and uh, independent or not, then simply, uh, uh, you know, investigate, write, and so on. There isn't any easy answer to this because well, the, 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 key, the that, key was mentioned there about editors. It's actually trying to get interest in these things because well, that's why, well, that's why I knew. See, the reason uh, I, I knew that if I was to go and speak to some journalists, and I know many, many journalists around the world over a lifetime. Obviously, I've acquired uh, many uh, colleagues and contacts. Uh, you know, but I wasn't interested, quite honestly, in going to the media. I was interested for my own reasons. I'm not, I'm not interested in destroying the UA. I'm not interested in destroying UNOPS. I'm not interested in, in destroying multilateral cooperation and the global public good. And uh, I'm outraged because I support the UN and I'm outraged when people betray the UN to the corrupt and fraudulent nexus that the people in power and, this, and the web they spin around themselves. And I simply decided to write about it, if you like. If more people were to do that, with a zero tolerance policy around their own experiences, not wait for the big stories that are going to kind of, uh, you know, take over the news headlines. You see, let the story speak for itself and whoever listens, listens, whoever doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't. So that's my approach. And I would say to journalists, if you really care for your craft, then uh, uh, in your area, wherever you are, little or large, uh, important or not important, prominent or not pr prominent, do your duty. Mukesh, I've got to take time for a PSA here. You should read Mukesh's blog, <laughs> blog uh, because it's extremely informative, have lots of material. It should be much better known in UN and headquarters than it is. Uh, but we'll come back to the fact that you were almost, you're not, you're not getting the due deference for blowing the whistle on this to begin with. Um, but one of the reasons is you've just come through it it's very difficult to get interest unless you're attacking the UN. The reason the oil for food so-called scandal, because there was a scandal, but it wasn't the one they were talking about, was because politically motivated people in America wanted uh, an ax to hit Kofi Annan with for not being supportive enough of the Iraq war. So that was the motive why they did it. They weren't interested in a few shiploads of grain or petrol here or there because They've been conniving at this across the Turkish border for years. It was to get Kofi Annan, and that's why people are interested. And that's one of the problems if you do a UN story, is the motivation of those who are interested in promoting it becomes very questionable indeed. Uh, running counter to what you're saying is that uh, we actually support the institution and its uh, ideals, whereas other people want to use whatever you produce to hit them with. And I think that's one of the reasons why some of the better journalists are diffident about such stories. Well, let, me, let me make an important correction. Uh, I was the whistleblower for the Darfur genocide, okay? There is no question about that, that's well established. 
the word whistleblower has a peculiar meaning. I mean, I'm not, and the, you know, there are whistleblower protection and legislation. So there is a phrase for that. I am not the whistleblower as far as this UNOP story is concerned, okay? I was sitting here quietly minding my own uh, business and working on many other issues, maybe writing, beginning to write my third book and talking about many things. But the whistleblower inside UNOPS plus many other people uh, got in touch with me. So all I have done is uh, used my platform for whatever it is worth and my name for whatever that is worth to give voice to the people inside UNOPS who are the whistleblower and others who provided the valuable information allowing me to write. I, I, I would not have been able to write anything if it were not for the fact that good and concerned people inside UNOPS, and now I'm hearing from all sorts of people in other UN agencies writing and telling me about the terrible things that are happening all over the world. If they hadn't told me this, uh, I wouldn't have been able to write. So my, I want to pay tribute to those staff uh, inside the UN system who despite everything uh, we heard about and despite all the attacks, have the courage to do their job, to stand up for the wrongdoings. And it's thanks to them that this uh, story has been uh, exposed. And all I've done is actually put their words used <laughs> their, their information and uh, their confidence and trust in me uh, because of my background in, to bring it to the public, uh, uh, public uh, domain. And I want to really use this opportunity to honor them uh, for, uh, for doing that. And through that to give courage to the thousands of other people in other UN agencies and not just UN agencies, but other aid organizations, multilateral organizations, some of whom are multi-billion dollar organizations in their own, own right, to themselves the courage to confront wrongdoing wherever they are and to have zero tolerance policy and to have the courage to stand up. Because if more people stood up, that then these kinds of things would not be allowed to continue. And that's the real uh, kind of uh, project I have in mind, and I've got some ideas on how we might do that uh, in the future. I know for, oh, Kristen, you go. Well, I'm just seeing other questions, <clears throat> excuse me, come up in the chat. Uh, has there been any more accountability other than the executive director and Van Schilboim? Uh, certainly it hasn't been publicized. Um, have you heard of any more? I, I presume they're waiting for the results of this opaque investigation. Uh, before we hear that, but uh, that's also disturbing that uh, people that were directly involved would still be working. Um, do you have any knowledge of that? Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, I have a, a negative knowledge of that in the sense that uh, when uh, uh, the acting director, Jens Wendell, was questioned on this very subject in the briefing to the board and in, in the recent uh, um, uh, formal board meeting, uh, he said, one, that the only person who was being investigated was Wenchelboim, who is on so-called administrative leave. I don't know, I mean, it's contrary. Well, who's apparently a years-long close connection to him. So the question of how assiduous he'll be in the investigation has been indeed. raised by some of our yeah. interlocutors. Yeah, indeed, there, there is a nexus of personal relationships and scratching mutual backs that is well established. So, 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 my worry, so the answer to your question very bluntly, we do not know the scope of the investigation because it's secret. Now, I think even in, uh, sorry if I get passionate about this, but even if you go to the most reprehensible regime in the world, in the most dictatorial regime in the world, you would at least have the ritual of a court. And there would be at least a pet lawyer who would read out the charges and who would, uh, they would go through uh, at least a process that uh, even if it was a fake uh, process that uh, the, the captive public would be able to see, right? In the case of the UN, we don't even have a, 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 a scope or terms of reference for any investigation. And uh, even though if you, you know, if you were in, uh, living in Stalin's time or in, uh, or in one of those regimes that we have many of in the current time, you would have at least a fake process. I mean, a, not a fake, a process in, in, a, in a rigged court at least. Here, the whole system is rigged. So uh, we have no idea 
uh, how, uh, how far this investigation is being allowed to explore. All we know is that he's only looking at Vitali because Greta said so and his successor says so. So how are you going to find accountability if you're not looking at the totality of the picture and you're looking into all the people that uh, have a role around it? Now, uh, now uh, Jens Wendel is reported to have said, oh, uh, uh, association is not guilt. Absolutely, I totally agree with that, you see. But when you surround yourself by the same people who have engineered the, this uh, scam, and they still are now your senior management team to advise you on the responses to the questions that the US, Finland, and other questions are asking, what are you supposed to conclude from that exercise? And the, the secret report of the secret investigation, according to secret terms of reference, into secret unspecified charges into unspecified people other than Vitaly Vanshalbom, I have no idea. I mean, and we're supposed to believe that? And we're supposed to think that is justice? And we're supposed to use that as a model for accountability and transparency and uh, all the rest of it? But that's what's happening. So the answer to your short question is, even if tomorrow the result was or this investigation is uh, somehow uh, revealed by Antonio Guterres because he's, in, he's under so much pressure at the, at the moment, and I'm reasonably optimistic a report will come out. But when it comes out, will it be the full report or will it be redacted? We will not know because uh, you can edit up, uh, accordingly as you, as, you, as you wish. I spent enough time in the UN to know how to write reports uh, uh, that uh, uh, I want to reveal nothing in or only reveal what uh, I want to reveal uh, in it. You know, we are trained in that kind of uh, uh, skill, if you like. So uh, I, that's why I keep on saying this is a charade until unless, uh, unless a duly constituted investigative authority of a member state with, uh, with uh, credibility. United States, uh, Denmark, or Finland have locus here, you see. Uh, you know, empower this and impunity is lifted. I mean, the the privilege and immunity are lifted and all the documents are brought to the surface. My worry at the moment is a cleanup operation is going on. So the, the documents are being doctored, removed, and even forensic uh, electronic auditing will find it difficult uh, to do that. So I'm afraid uh, uh, it's going to be difficult to bring accountability. It doesn't mean to say we don't uh, stop. And already in the court of public opinion, at least, it's very clear that wrong, shady doings have been going on at the top of uh, UNOPS and that the people who are currently still running the organization and they have been protected and supported by the Secretary General and the oversight services within the UN Secretary in New York, they are, you know, implicated in this. Yeah, the old boys and girls network always exonerates itself. And well, I, don't, I don't know if I've answered, in, answered your question, Kirsten, but the short answer is, even if a report is released uh, uh, tomorrow, you would need to exercise your special X revision to, to uh, judge its uh, uh, veracity. And the question has just come up, and it, it's, a, it's about the almost about the strange subculture of the UN in New York, <clears throat> where there's lots of small countries that can't afford to run missions. Uh, recently, we had the sad and I think very suspicious death of the former president of the General Assembly, who was... Uh, weightlifting equipment accidentally fell on his throat after he'd been implicated in some deals with the Chinese. Um, but, you know, apart from the murderous consequences there, his country couldn't afford to pay the phone bill. And yet he was the president of the General Assembly. So the money came from elsewhere. So you have ambassadors who have no connection to the country. At one point, the ambassador of Belize was, as I remember, the Conservative Party treasurer from Britain who got diplomatic immunity. And the point in the UN is the instant deference to ambassadors, regardless, means that these people have highly privileged access. You know, they get a red carpet right into the, right into the till, it seems, <laughs> in this case. <clears throat> and uh, it, it's, it, it's something about this, this culture, the fact that these countries are there and also infused, as uh, Kristen and others have pointed out, with the free market zealotry that, that making money is good and it's a creditable thing and hiving off public functions to private companies is 
excellently, superbly efficient when all the evidence shows differently. Um, so so the, it, it, it's more than just um, a managerial problem. It's a culture problem, isn't it? Well, um, uh, th th there is indeed a deep problem about the governance of the international system. Please remember that the UN is, is the sum total of its member states. And uh, the rules and the privileges that have been agreed uh, by the member states has uh, been uh, by agreement of the member states. And obviously, it's only as good as the member states wish to make it. You know, very often member states use and abuse the UN for their own purposes. And that can be political, that can be economic, that can be due to uh, short-term gains, that can be due to long-term, for long-term strategic reasons. And all member states, uh, in the end, after all, the UN is a political project. And in political projects, uh, all sorts of things are fair game, including wars. Uh, so uh, uh, what to say about this? However, we should not confuse the matter of a global, uh, uh, the way the world works, if you like, if I can put it in those broad terms, with the integrity and uh, good governance of the institutions of the world. So it may well be that all sorts of countries do all sorts of shady things around the world. That is not an excuse or a justification or an alibi for the misdeeds, the misconduct, mismanagement, the lies and cover-ups that are within the institutions of, that can be within the institutions of the, of the, of the UN system and not just in UNOPS. We've got many examples of this uh, in many other organizations where these things happen. Of course, bad things can happen in any, any organization. You only have to look at your national uh, governments to realize uh, fraud and corruption take place uh, everywhere, uh, everywhere in the world. And, but then there are systems, there are, there are processes to, uh, to do something about it. Uh, you know, may or may not work, but at least there is a, there is a policy of non-tolerance and at least a, a lip service is given to the principle of transparency and accountability. Citizens ask for information and, and usually they get something of that information. And if someone has been wrong, there is some process to do something about it. Now, in the UN system, there is nothing. And what there is, is under the control of the person who decides everything, what you want to do or uh, I don't, don't want to do. So I think before we lose ourselves in, a, in, a, in this uh, kind of mindset that, uh, you know, that everything is corrupt, uh, all is wrong, and it's all hopeless, and, uh, you know, we might as well go home and uh, uh, kind of uh, do whatever we do at home. Uh, in your case, you seem to have a lot of decent, a lot of nice bottles in the background. Um, <laughs> yeah, and now, uh, you know, please keep, up, keep the ball on the, on the uh, you know, there are many things wrong in the world, but just because many things are wrong in the world doesn't mean to say that we should condone what uh, wrongs in the system we have created and for which anybody would say it's a system for the global good and it's being betrayed by the people who have been uh, placed in power. So regardless of bad ambassadors or whoever you want to, uh, to, uh, to blame in terms of many examples uh, one can get through history of the last uh, 70 years uh, in a way, this is, does not condone what is going on in terms of the structure, makeup, systems, and cover-ups in the, in the system. Now, I don't see why, and there are plenty of decent ambassadors and there are plenty of decent countries in the, in the world also. It is in their interest to do something about it, starting at the very top of the organizations that we are uh, talking about. So this culture doesn't just lead to the odd $70 million falling into the gutter, of course. It means that the human rights will not investigate what's happening in Yemen because of Saudi financial clout and people's deference to it. It means that right across the world, there are North Korea, for God's sake, as a chair of the disarmament, nuclear disarmament committee. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, well, I think one has one to whistle with admiration at the chutzpah of the system that produces results like this, putting King Herod in charge of uh, UNICEF. I think... Uh, Politics is politics, and in, in the name of politics, good and bad things uh, happen. But when you mix politics with corruption, then the effect of politics and corruption combined is not additive, it's multiplicative. That's what this UNOS experience shows, 
or other experiences shows. Sure, there are arms sales going on in the world, there are human rights abuses going on in the world. The High Commission for Human Rights went to China recently on the Uyghur question and, uh, and attracted a lot of justified criticism uh, for, uh, for doing that. There was sexual abuse and exploitation and, and that took place amongst WHO staff in the in the in the in the uh, in the Congo uh, in relation to the in, in the, the DRC in relation to the uh, Ebola uh, outbreak uh, control and I've seen in a lifetime of humanitarian work abuse of hum in uh, humanitarian situations where refugees and others have had to trade sexual services in return for humanitarian aid. Oh, these many things uh, uh, go on, but when the corruption gets in the way of either the foibles of bad people, if you like to see, or evil politics comes in, then the people who suffer are actually the people at the very bottom. You know, if you want to, be, if you want, if you want to do politics, and and uh, you know, if China and America want to square up to each other, that's fair game, uh, if you like to see. But if you then, in the process, crush the most poor and vulnerable. And, and it is not they who crush the poor and vulnerable. Uh, it is the institutions like the UN who, are, who, who in, a, in a sense get put in the position or behave in such a way that they betray the poor and vulnerable. That's when, when I think uh, there is scope for intervention and scope for improvement and there is scope for reform. We may not be able to do much about world politics, but there's a hell of a lot we can do about some of the abuses that go on with impunity in the multilateral system as we see today. Ian We're mentioned. coming towards the end now. Kristen, I was going to say, can you come in with a, a killer question to finish? <laughs> <laughs> well, Ian mentioned uh, the, the, the role of uh, ambassadors uh, in this uh, scheme, introducing people, connecting uh, people to the funding. Um, there's a question about that in the chat in terms of how common is it for uh, people who are well connected and maybe have no connection to the country they represent to get jobs like that and, it, it, and is that something uh, that the UN should be having rules against? Um, do you know how common it is um, for uh, people to get well, those ambassadorships? Uh, are there are there others uh, other than this man, this ambassador um, of Dominica who was supposedly behind introducing different factor, different parties to each other in this scheme? Uh, is that common? Well, firstly, uh, let us, uh, you know, in calling uh, Kettle's, uh, what's the expression, calling the pot black or something, uh, how are ambassadors appointed? Some countries have professional foreign, uh, foreign uh, uh, systems appointment. Then there are others, and this includes the richest countries in the world. So for example, if you happen to be a leading financial financier of the Republicans in the US or the Democrats in the UN, depending on who is in power, and then uh, your uh, person is appointed uh, to the key position of uh, American ambassador in uh, London, that's the way the system works. And so before we blame small countries here and there, let us understand that the appointment of ambassadors and based on many considerations where the country is concerned, including the, the, the closeness to the government to leader back at home, and undoubtedly there's a financial element to that, uh, has a role in all this. And by the way, uh, certainly my experience of uh, diplomacy uh, is, uh, uh, is that uh, the ambassadors themselves are, by, are not necessarily the most important because an ambassador is uh, more symbolic. So even when I was in a, in a, in a headquarters position in uh, London and the, the British ambassadors all over, all, over the, all over the world, they just reported to whichever desk officer was uh, there for Africa or Southern Africa or West Asia or whatever it was. You see, the ambassadors may voice the decisions may be fronting it and they might make uh, uh, ponderous statements in uh, um, security council or general assembly, but policy is set in capitals, if you, if you like to see. So uh, you got to understand that uh, the ambassadors, of course, there are some ambassadors who lack unilaterally, 
because the country is so dysfunctional. So if you happen to be Afghan ambassador at a time when uh, the government is uh, disputed, uh, then uh, clearly you have great freedom to decide which way you want to vote or not vote. So there are exceptions. However, the, it's a political thing. And for politics, read money. And for money, read, uh, uh, read politics. And whether you're a rich country or a poor country, small country or a big country, certain rules prevail, if you like. A government in power is hardly going to appoint uh, an opponent of that government to a key diplomatic uh, position in Paris or London or Washington, uh, DC. So, uh, so we may rant and rave about ambassadors who have abused their position, who have behaved corruptly, and there have been plenty of, uh, plenty of those. But I don't think the UN can be blamed for that because the UN doesn't have the power to decide on this. I mean, uh, host government, so for example, when I was appointed the UN uh, coordinator and head of the UN in Sudan, I needed agreement from the government of, uh, of Sudan, uh, you know, uh, like any other ambassador would. And if the government of Sudan had de denied, uh, de denied giving me agreement, I could not have gone into, 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 into Khartoum. Of course, later on, they regretted they had done that because I blew the whistle on their genocide. But that's a separate story. Mm. But in the other way around, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, some country X says, oh, look, I, my ambassador and permanent uh, um, uh, representative in New York is going to be X, Y, Z, what can the UN do? So, uh, and I don't... Well, they can say they have to be a, a national of the country. Uh, right. Well, today, what is a national of a country? So, uh, you know, my own daughter, uh, I, won't, uh, I won't name who she is uh, because she'll get mad at me if I do. Uh, uh, she has at least three nationalities, right? Mm -hmm. By her birth, by her marriage, by her, by, and by her residence, and in uh, one case by descent from, uh, from uh, me, uh, distant part, right? Now, uh, if she decides to become an ambassador, it, technically she could be the ambassador of four countries uh, or at least three of those four, uh, four countries. And today you can buy a nationality and you can have second nationality. And <laughs> diplomatic credentials as well, it seems. So you, you get the and, two in a package deal. But uh, then, we, we, we are coming towards the end now. And uh, we've had one, I think, I think it was a complaint. How do you link sex to this? Because <laughs> I just wanted to explain that we were, I thought we were dealing more with the cover up of sexual harassment and, uh, and sexual exploitation which we touched upon, but we didn't cover in the full detail. But those whistle whistleblowers about sexual harassment get the same treatment as whistleblowers about corruption. And we are coming towards the end now. I really got to thank, it's been a spirited discussion. Thank you very much, Mukesh. We hope to see more of you soon. And perhaps we can discuss some ways in which we can sort of perhaps run a, a bulletin board of things that journalists should be looking at and give them pointers and clues and, and needs. Uh, here and in Geneva and the rest, there's too much of the UN because all the world is there. So on behalf of Mukesh, who I think has done wonderful work, of Kristen, who is uh, with Al Jazeera, has been doing great work at the United Nations. Uh, I'm Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association. We hope to do a lot more of this and, uh, you know, stir the pot. That's our motto. <laughs> Speaking truth to power with the Foreign Press Association. Please. Join us, sign up for our lists, and remember that all of this costs money, which we don't have after the COVID epidemic. So contributions gratefully accepted without strings, I might add. No strings. <laughs> <laughs> and any checks with strings on will be ignited and disposed of in the bomb disposal squad. So thank you very much, everybody. Look forward to seeing you again soon. And uh, especially thank you, Mukesh, for your efforts here, both in exposing this and coming to tell us about it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank Good you, afternoon. Cash. Thank you.